Normally, to start off, what I do is I do a quick definition of what a corpus is because people may be unfamiliar or have not really worked with it very much. So, um, a corpus is a, an electronically stored searchable collection of texts which can be written or spoken, and it can be quite large, like billions of words, or it can be a small one that you compile yourself to hundreds of words. Uh, it's good for reading, searching, and manipulating large quantities. So, for example, manipulating could be in a learner corpus. You could put coding on them and find uh, error codes and then recall them quickly and find out what's going on. So that's something that I was doing. And uh, a corpus is descriptive, so it's describing how language is used. It's not prescriptive. It's not telling you what to do. Um, two examples. You've got the British National Corpus. You can see it's 100 million words. It's, it's a good one. It's a corpus that keeps giving. <laughs> and uh, it's the, there's a learner corpus as well, which uh, it's ongoing from Cambridge exams uh, with a lot of um, language backgrounds there. Right? So there's two, there are many other examples as well. Uh, one point I'd like to make at the outset <coughs> is that uh, Ivor Timmis works with uh, ELT and Corpora, and he was saying that like technophobes uh, can relax, uh, it's uh, user friendly, and there, there's lots of tutorials now. I feel that there's just you can do a lot even on your phone, it's great. I, I use it a lot in class now with students. Um, then as well, uh, Mounier was saying that you know you go beyond the pen and paper, but it doesn't have to imply uh, a technological big bang. So it does. We, we can embrace this. It's very easy to embrace. It's not a problem. Um, yeah, I was trying to make a definition of what a corpus informed teacher is, and um, I was saying that thinking something like it's someone who's tuned into a, a range of books, resources, and tools to help with teacher, uh, better teacher and, and language practice as well. Um, because Tim was just making a good point, he said that it, makes, it means you're in a better position to make opportunistic decisions in the classroom, reacting to language as it arises, uh, and for learners as well to be, to be more autonomous with it. Um, it's good for many things. One thing we could talk about here is intuition checking and hypothesis testing. and. Um, I, I don't have much time to speak about this, but I would like to speak about it more. But for example, with intuition, Krishnamurti uh, was talking about something. Uh, we tend to notice the unusual in class, salient stuff like uh, you know idioms, raining cats and dogs or something. But the ordinary can bypass us sometimes, and that's what the, can be the biggest obstacles, you know. And the ordinary is a very uh, rich scene to mine. So uh, an example would be that uh, there are, if you're speaking in spoken language, uh, nearly 50% of language, there are only 12 lexical verbs used in 50% of the time. Uh, I wonder whether anyone know what the most frequent verb is in spoken language. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Congratulations. I think it's almost from Anna B. Uh, there you go, there's 12. Notice, uh, curiously, do is not in that list, uh, which is very interesting. Now, it's, that doesn't mean that it's infrequent, it just means that it doesn't occur in that frequency. That bracket. Um, so, uh, that's Bible and Conrad, who uh, work uh, a lot with uh, corpus linguistics. Uh, how could frequency inform teaching? Well, for example, Biber was talking about, um, you know, it get on its own is obviously, it's a very a word with a lot of potential. So uh, we need ex exposure needed for the range of meanings around it. I think that's a very important word, uh, the exposure uh, of, of that in class. And that's what corpus can give students, that they're, they're, while they're dealing with things, they're, they're absorbing and working with language all at the same time, spoken and written. Um, frequency information also gives better coverage of the words as well. Um, so materials based on intuitions, I'm like yourself, I'm not a big fan of course books. I think that the intuitions used in, the, in them are kind of strange sometimes. And um, so if you're going to be talking about gets, get the frequent gets and um, help students have language that they're going to be encountering in real life situations, you know, in, in whatever uh, genre you're speaking about. Um, however, of, of course, corpus findings should not dictate what is taught. They need to pass through a pedagogic filter. Okay, so the teacher in the circumstance and the situation will, will ultimately know what the best thing to do is. Uh, corpus can help with resources. So there could be teacher-directed and learner-directed. So I'm going to really talk about something quickly here. Like if it's teacher-directed, imagine you're doing presentations. So um, you could imagine you're talking about these things like discourse markers and those kind of things. Uh, you could go to a corpus informed grammar book. You could find examples of these things. And then you could go to a site like the TED Corpus site, which is very good. So you can listen, see, read, and find it all there. And you could link to, to dictionaries and things like that. It's a very good site. As a teacher, you could put it up on the board. You could highlight photocopies or something like that. And then you're the facilitator of the learner going on in the room. That takes a minute to organize. You have your book, you get it, you do that, and then you can go with your, with your IWB, for example. 
It could be learner directed, which is where uh, you're reacting to language in class. So, uh, for example, when words come up, you can explore patterns, frequencies, etc. Um, I have a thing that's called registers, preferences, and prosodies, which is registers, is it spoken or written? Uh, preferences is what's the semantic associations with it? And prosodies means is it positive or negative? Um, I'll be talking about these with a quick example in a few minutes. Uh, I think it's good for implicit learning, which is learning by doing, exploring, <coughs> confidence and motivation and agency. I think it's very, very important. There's a lot of this in the literature as I've been reading these things. Uh, benefits of being corpus informed. I think it's great for uh, creating your own materials or for adapting materials. It's good for academic English and business English, for example. Um, if you're interested in syllabus design, analytic type B syllabus, which is non-intervention, the syllabus which is teaching in chunks, teaching with authentic language, if you're interested in that, it's great for that, I feel, or the discrete item syllabus if you, if you need to follow that. Um, I would encourage teacher trainers to try and include it too. I've been, as I said, because I do sell to myself sometimes, um, it's difficult to find the time uh, to include those things, but uh, it's, it's feasible. Um, and CPD programs as well. Uh, if, if you're a, a managerial, if you have a managerial position, uh, it can be easily done. Um, I think it's very good because it's evidence-based, uh, which is very, very important. It's much needed uh, for, for work that people do. It's connected. It informs the European framework. It's very common in editing and publishing, and there's a great community of people who share stuff online. And um, it's very common in MA programs. Should people be uh, moving in that direction in the future? And then I think it's great for uh, things that are coming into the classroom, like mobile assisted language learning and open educational resources, and maybe people who are looking to um, uh, supply platforms or aggregate information themselves, they can, they can uh, use this as the bedrock of what they're doing, all the other work. Um, okay, uh, basically Leach it was a linguist who, in 1997, very clearly foresaw how uh, corpora could inform uh, teaching. And he divided it into three categories. I don't have time to speak about this very much, but basically he was talking about dictionaries and grammar. He was right, learner corpus, he was right. In the classroom, it didn't quite pan out that way. So that's a little bit how I just want to finish the talk today. So um, I adapted Leach's point two there about using it in the classroom, and um, I put a client in, because teachers have to have clients. And, uh, so level one would be dictionaries and grammars, and these can be online or um, paper, the paper dictionaries. I think we, we we're moving away from dictionaries a bit, maybe, with kind of the Google, uh, Google things, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, grammars can be um, partially informed by corpora are less so, and the ones that are less so are the more the ones that are skewed with intuition, and we have to be kind of careful with them, I'm finding as well as I go along. Uh, the second ones are open access corpus sites, which I'll, I'll show if you, I was like the TED corpus one I was talking about a moment ago. And these are the, what I call the Spotify model, where like you were talking, the thing you were talking about earlier, you register them, and you have a kind of a freemium or a premium model. Like that, but even the freemium model of Spotify is actually quite good, you know. So th there's that, and then there's the more advanced ones, which are um, uh, like you download software, you maybe make a corpus, and you analyze your corpus, and you can do that in class as well if you want. If you have a little bit of tr uh, mentoring or training, that's possible. So. In terms of dictionaries, there's three really good ones. Uh, all dictionaries are corpus informed now, so you're, you're going to a good uh, place there. Uh, yeah, recently the word meditation came up in class, and someone threw it into Google, and it just said the act of meditating. Which <laughs> <laughs> is kind of, uh, it's very frustrating. Uh, yeah, the Cambridge Learner Dictionary is good. It's difficult to see, but you get the level of the word, so it tells you it's B1 or C1 or something like that. So that's, that's good. It's quite limited, though. The Collins one is amazing. It has a video of someone saying it, it has charts of when it peaked and troughed, and it gives you context from the internet and all that kind of thing. So that's a really, really good one. Uh, apologies, it didn't come out as clear as I, I, I hoped it would. Uh, grammars, um, this is a brilliant one. Uh, this is from my Kindle. Uh, it's very, very heavily corpus informed, but it's great for a new teacher or it's great for a very, very experienced teacher. Uh, this is a more linguistic one, these two here. Uh, they were talking about lexicogrammar, which I would really, really encourage people to investigate. Uh, they're good. And this series is amazing. It's the In Use series from Michael McCarthy. Uh, very heavily corpus informed. A little bit dry. You just got a list of uh, like collocations here and exercises, but um, a bit of magic teacher dust on that. Uh, like yeah. kind of enliven it, you know, <laughs> if, if you have such dust. Um, oh, we all have it. <laughs> <laughs> if you are not interested in this area, which you may not be, and you're taking away one thing, take away that book, okay? It's amazing because it's Murphy with statistics. 
right? <laughs> <laughs> it says here, you teach in progressive in class, and this is what the books say. However, the books are wrong because this is the reality. Not so common it is the simple tense in spoken language, and not so common the progressive and the perfect tenses are in spoken language. And these are common verbs which are state verbs, but which can be used in gerunds. Think of this. And it's very clearly laid out, and it's for learners. Um, it's a really, really good book. Uh, it's again, it needs that kind of magic dust, right? Um, and then the open access yeah. sites. Go back. Go back to one, sorry. I was looking slow off the mark there. I just kind of. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, that book's about twenty quid, I think. Um, uh, the open access sites, there's a big list of them there, I've, I've been collecting them and um, I'll just give you an example of one and I'll go back to, remember my preferences, prosodies and, and, and things like that, right? So uh, a student found this, we we're looking for the word dull and the student found that the, the word dull goes with colour, noise and pain, right? Uh, which is probably logical enough, but imagine you're learning a word, just writing dull and translating it. I think that you get more, more out of it when you do this. So there's scale, it's, it's the premium Spotify model, right? So she put in dull and she went through all these here and she found this and then um, you click on that and you get the contextual sentence. So you're seeing the context of what's going on. I, I think that's very, very important. And then you can click on it again and you can get synonyms here. Um, the one thing this doesn't do, it doesn't tell you where it's from. So I don't know if it's from a newspaper, if it's from academic language, if it's from spoken language or that. So that's why the freemium model can be kind of restrictive sometimes. Um, these are the more advanced kind of ones where you're analysing a corpus yourself. So maybe, you know, if, if you're into this, you might be in, uh, interested in these, but uh, maybe there's something for later on for you. And um, there's some software for you to download. I worked with these when I was doing my, my uh, thesis last year. And then, uh, for example, the British National Corpus, to go way back to what I was speaking at the beginning, the, the one that keeps giving, do you remember that one? Uh, for example, a word came up during the week, tall and high. What's the difference between tall and high? Uh, in contexts, right? It was in a book. So I put it into the British National Corpus, and I said, what does it frequently collocate with? And uh, you get um, the frequent collocates of tall, and the frequent collocates of high. And I had to really, 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 really go down to find a word that worked with both. So uh, for learners, that was amazing. And they were like, well, that, we did that on the phone in class, right? So, so that's great. And that's all. Thank you very much. That's my reference. <laughs>